Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Mickey mccomb Kobza. I'm the director of Ocean First Institute. We are a nonprofit organization based out of Boulder, Colorado, and our mission is ocean conservation through research and education. So we go into the field and do marine science uh, research and bring those stories back into the classroom to share with students all over the world. And today, I'm excited, we're gonna be hosting a webinar uh, to share the truth about sharks, the true story of sharks on our planet. And I'm really excited uh, to be able to share that with you. So what I'm gonna go ahead and do is share my screen with you. So bear with me for one second as I get started. All right, and here we go. Uh, so again, I'm gonna talk about my favorite thing in the whole world and that is sharks. And I'll start by just telling you uh, briefly a little bit about how I got interested um, in sharks in the first place. So I grew up as a young uh, girl in the mountains of Colorado, and things changed for me when I was about seven years old. I saw the famous movie Jaws, um, which is all about a scary shark, and uh, it was definitely terrifying for me. It changed my life. So I left that movie and thought sharks were under my bed, under the kitchen table, um, I tried out for the swim team and I made it because little did the coach know I was swimming from sharks coming out of the drain. So it was a little ridiculous, but um, my fear of sharks was genuine. It was real. And the only way that I knew to overcome that was to learn more about them. And the more I read about sharks, the more I recognized they weren't the monsters that you see in the movies like Sharknado. Um, they just aren't the, they, those aren't the, the true sharks that are in our ocean today. And so the more I read about them, the more uh, they captured my fascination, the more I truly uh, just could not stop learning about them and wanting to know more and wanted to share their story um, with as many people as I could because it was so fascinating. And so I have spent much of my life since then uh, trying to connect people to sharks and to have them understand what sharks are really like. Uh, so as I got a little bit older, I moved down to Florida and pursued a dream to become a scuba instructor. So if you've ever um, been scuba diving, uh, it really is extraordinary. It's like being an astronaut, but you're an aquanaut, and you never know what you're going to see when you're underwater. It's really uh, a, an incredible experience. And so I spent many years uh, underwater every day. Uh, connecting people uh, to the ocean and swimming with sharks and seeing people experience that thrill and it was transformative for me and it opened up some other doors and opportunities for me to pursue a career as a researcher so I got a PhD studying sharks uh, down in Florida asking questions um, about how they find each other underwater how sharks move um, where do they go uh, and asking questions about why hammerhead heads or hammerhead sharks have the strange head shape that they do, how well do they see, how do they use their sensory systems. So it's, uh, it's been an extraordinary journey uh, to become a researcher and, and travel and work with other researchers to ask some pretty fundamental questions about sharks. And so when we talk about sharks and study them, I think it's really important to put into context the expanse of time, and that's a hard concept, but our universe is thought to be over 14 billion years old, and our planet Earth over 4.6 billion years old. And when we look at our planet from space, it's easy to see that we really are planet ocean. And because we have water on our planet, we have life. And life took a long time to evolve and, and expand, but it, around 440 million years ago, life got big and interesting, and that was when we saw the rise and the diversification of the jawed vertebrates, including the sharks. And so these are some of the early sharks. Um, the one on the right with what looks like an ironing board on his back is Stegeocanthidae, and the one on the top left is um, Heliocoprion. It looks like it has a circular saw uh, as a jaw. So these are some prehistoric sharks uh, which gave rise to many of the sharks that are swimming in our ocean today. And remember, this is way before the time of the dinosaurs. Dinosaurs arose 200 million years ago, but they're not on our planet anymore. 
all we know about the dinosaurs comes from the fossil record. And around 65 million years ago, dinosaurs went extinct. And we think it's because of a large meteor impact that changed conditions on Earth so much so that dinosaurs were no longer able to survive. But who was swimming in the ocean at that time? Sharks. And so the story of sharks is the story of survival. They have lived through five mass extinction events, uh, and they are extraordinary. They are closely related to animals called skates and rays. They're collectively called elasmobranchs, and they have a shared characteristic. They have skeletons on the inside, just like you and I do, but their skeletons are made of cartilage, which is the stuff at the end of your nose and in your ears. And because they have been on Earth for so long, they have moved into nearly every aquatic habitat, from the brightly lit coral reefs, we see reef sharks thriving, to the muddy waters of the Amazon, we see freshwater stingrays. I've, I've been able to study these beautiful rays. Some of them have beautiful polka dot markings. They're gorgeous. We have sharks living under ice in the polar regions. This is the Greenland shark. And new research that has come out uh, says this shark may live over 200 years. It might even be one of the longest to live vertebrates on Earth. And we have sharks like this frilled shark that live in the deep, dark ocean where no sunlight can even penetrate. And so when we study sharks, you know, we're really looking back in time as to all of the different environments that have shaped the adaptations in the over 500 species swimming today. And there are differences in body shape, in the color, uh, in the fin shapes, in the way they swim through the water, uh, in the ways that they reproduce. So really, the story of the shark is also a story of tremendous diversity. And so I wanna take you on a journey with me now to uh, see some different species, some of which you've probably seen before, and maybe a few you haven't. Uh, so let's start with the biggest shark in the ocean, the biggest one. This is the whale shark. Uh, whale sharks can be upwards of 50 feet long, as big as a school bus. And they have this beautiful pattern of dots all over uh, their body. And you can see here, this is a video uh, of a whale shark swimming through the water. And the water is very green. It's full of tiny, uh, nearly microscopic plants and animals called plankton. And this is myself and my son swimming over to look at this whale shark. And you might think, why would you take your child into the water with a big shark? Well, because this shark is totally harmless. It's eating those tiny plants and animals um, in the water column called uh, phytoplankton and zooplankton. So the biggest fish in the ocean is being fueled by nearly microscopic plants and animals. That's kind of amazing to consider. All right, so to go from the biggest to nearly the smallest, this is the dwarf lantern shark. It could fit in the palm of your hand. Um, it's a deep sea shark, and there are species like the velvet belly lantern shark that glow in the dark. Can you imagine a shark that glows in the dark? Well, this one does. It uses chemicals inside its body to create light called bioluminescence, and its belly glows green. And it's believed that this is a strategy to allow the shark to blend into the downwelling light from the sun. Uh, and so it's a strategy for camouflage. Pretty amazing. This is the pocket shark. Why do sharks need pockets? So the pocket shark has a small pocket on the side of its body. This is a very small shark, just like the other one you just saw. Um, what does it have a pocket for? So researchers have discovered that this shark has pheromones, or almost like perfume, inside this pocket. And then it's used to help different pocket sharks, males and females, find each other underwater. So chemicals helping uh, the sharks locate each other um, to be able to mate and reproduce. Uh, this shark also has what are called photophores on its belly, and that allows it to glow um, similarly um, to the velvet belly lantern shark. There is an entire group of sharks called carpet sharks, and you can see that in this banded wabagong shark. It looks like a bad piece of carpet. Um, it's 
ornately camouflaged. It has tassels near the head um, to help it conceal itself on the sea floor. It also doesn't have to continually swim. Some sharks must swim um, to push water and oxygen over their gills in order to survive. Those are called ram ventilators, but other species um, are called buccal pumpers. They don't have to continually swim. They can just pump water over their gills um, as they're sitting on the sea floor. So some very big differences in the lifestyles of these sharks. This is a pajama shark. I was able to study the shark in South Africa. They're a part of the cat shark family. It looks like it's wearing striped pajamas. And then did you know that there is a shark that can walk on land? Who <laughs> knew? We have land sharks, but we do. And this shark is the Apollette shark. It uh, lives in Northern Australia and it uses its pectoral fins or its side fins and its pelvic fins in order to do a maneuver we call punting. It actually walks on the reef and it can go from different tide pools to feed on small trapped fish. So it's an adaptation um, for maximizing feeding. And it also allows the shark, if it gets trapped on uh, low, uh, low tide, to move back into the water. And this shark can live out of water um, for extended periods of time, definitely uh, upwards of 20, 30 minutes without any long-term damage. Okay, this is a really interesting shark, the mako shark. This is the fastest shark in the ocean. It is the cheetah of the sea. Um, it's the mako shark. And it has many unique adaptations. One is its eye. So because the mako shark is such a fast swimmer, um, it actually superheats its eyes. It has a network um, behind its eye called the Reedy Mirabile um, that allows it to superheat the eye, keeping the eye warm, warmer than the temperature of the water, and that actually allows that shark to maximize its visual abilities. Uh, so a wonderful um, adaptation, and you can see the mako coming in. This is a camera on the back of a boat with bait hanging off. You can see that mako is coming in and queuing in onto that bait with its eyes working at their optimum. And makos will chase, um, chase tuna and other fast moving prey, so those eyes are really critical. And, uh, and makos have been clocked upwards of almost 50 miles an hour. So imagine driving on the highway, looking out the window and seeing a mako shark swimming that fast. It's pretty incredible. Okay, this is a shark called the big eye thrusher. You can see the big eye, but the action here is in the tail. So the big eye thrusher has what we call a heterocercal tail. It just means that one lobe is much larger than the other, and that's the top lobe. And the big eye thresher uses its tail as a weapon. So it actually whips the tail around and stuns schools of fish with its tail. And then it's uh, able to swim and turn around and grab those stunned fish um, as a meal. So this again is an adaptation to maximize the feeding success of the big eye thresher. And threshers are known to jump out of the water. So off the coast of California, if you see a thresher shark jump out of the water, you know it's a thresher shark because of that very long tail. Pretty neat trick. Okay, this is another very unique shark, the bull shark. This is the number three most dangerous shark in the world. And the main reason why is because the bull shark shows up in places you would never expect to find a shark. And that includes rivers and lakes. So the bull shark has the ability um, to osmoregulate. And what that means is it can maintain the internal soft balance of its body to that of the water in which it's found. So it can move from fresh water to salt water and everything in between. And this is very unique um, to the bull shark. And in fact, I have been in the Everglades of Florida, which is a freshwater marsh, and seen baby bull shark pups um, swimming by. So it's thought that some female bull sharks will have their pups or their babies in fresh water um, to avoid other big predators. So it's an advantage um, for the bull shark in many ways. All right, and this is probably the ugliest shark in the ocean today. This is the goblin shark. It's Halloween all year for the goblin. Uh, but what you can see here clearly is this very long snout. So this elongated snout is called a rostrum. 
And we think that the goblin shark uses that snout to help it find its food. It lives in the deep ocean um, where food can be scarce. And so having that long snout might help. And you can also see it has needle-like teeth that are curved inward. So if the goblin gets something in its mouth, it's likely never coming back out because of that teeth, those teeth that are curved backwards. Um, but the weirdness doesn't end with the snout of the goblin shark. It also has another special feature. It actually is able to protrude its jaws out in order to capture its deep sea prey. So take a look at this video of the goblin shark as it encounters a diver's arm. It shoots those jaws out forward um, to try to get whatever it is in its mouth. So the diver and the shark are fine, but it just shows you how amazing that jaw protrusion is in the goblin shark. And again, they may bump into food only once or twice a week. So it's critical that they're able to get that food and keep it into their mouth and get it into their stomach. Okay, so to have a shark that has a really long snout this way, to then look at sharks that have heads that have been expanded this way, we go to the hammerhead sharks. So hammerheads are one of my most favorite shark species. And there's a couple of things you might not know about hammerheads. They are the most recently evolved sharks in our oceans. Um, the fossil record um, for hammerheads shows around 20 million years ago, we started to see the hammerheads. And what's also interesting is there's more than one species of hammerhead. So take a look at this, uh, uh, th these drawings of the different heads of the many different hammerhead species in our ocean today, and we're still discovering more. Um, recent uh, discoveries have uh, shown us there are more uh, hammerhead species that we didn't even know about. So what an exciting thing to realize. And, you know, we have only explored around 5% of our ocean, so there's so much out there that we still just don't know. It's exciting. Uh, anyway, so here's the hammerhead heads. You can see on the top one that is the bonnet head. It looks kind of like a normal shark. Then the one in the middle is the scalloped hammerhead. This is one that looks like a hammerhead you might think of. And then the one on the bottom has its own genus. It's called Euspira blockii. This is a winghead shark. This is what it looks like. This is a shark that only gets to be about a meter long, but its head width is half the total body length. So in essence, it looks like a swimming boomerang. Um, pretty incredible. This is what a bonnet head shark looks like. And one of the interesting things to consider about sharks is they all have an ancient sensory system that we don't have. They can detect living things underwater using a electro sense. So they can detect um, weak electric fields underwater. And this helps them find hidden prey like crabs and fish. Um, even a, a allowing them to find things at night when they might not be able to rely on their visual system. So again, sharks really do have a whole suite of senses that they use to be perfect predators. So, um, you know, you might wonder how does this knowledge help us? Uh, why is it important to learn about sharks, where they go, how they reproduce? Um, why is that important uh, for us to know? Well, one of the interesting things to think about is we just still don't know so much. Uh, we are still discovering some of the most basic things about sharks. There's still really uh, so many things about sharks that are a mystery, even species like the great white shark. Uh, you know, we watch Shark Week all the time and, and we're trying to learn more about such a, an iconic and famous shark species, but there are still so many things about them, like where do they reproduce? Um, where do they have their uh, pups? Uh, you know, how do they find each other you know, all over the world? Where do they go during a season? Do they stay in the same place or do they move or where do they go? These are all questions we still don't know. And this is uh, a great white shark filmed off of uh, Guadalupe Island in Mexico. And this could be one of the biggest sharks ever filmed. Her name is Deep Blue. Um, but you know what? We don't know because it's difficult to obtain information about these sharks. It's hard to work on them. Uh, and so a shark like this could be 20 feet long, but we have no way to know. And so uh, I, uh, working with the Institute, uh, have been using different techniques to try to measure sharks and to try to obtain more information about them. And one of the things that we uh, recently did in Guadalupe with the great white sharks was to use 
some technology to try to measure them underwater without even touching them. So it's a method that doesn't hurt them, it's, it, it, and it's using lasers. So we have two laser um, devices set 50 centimeters apart with a camera in between, and as the shark swims by, we're able to project those dots onto the side of the shark. And later, we can go back and look at the image and figure out how long the shark really is. And this is a great tool, understanding how big sharks are, um, looking at them coming back year to year, looking at specific individuals and, and knowing if they come back every year or two years, um, are they pregnant, um, are they having their pups here? All of these things help us understand sharks better and help us protect them better. So you might say, why do we want to protect sharks? Is that an important thing to do? Well, it is. And the main reason is many shark species are in decline today. And you may say, well, why are sharks in decline? Well, sharks are in decline because we're removing sharks out of the water faster than they can replace themselves. And one of the main reasons that sharks are removed is for their fins. Their fins are being used um, to fuel an industry uh, called the shark fin industry, where the fins are used to make a soup called shark fin soup. And so over, well, if we really don't know how many sharks are, are, are killed for shark fin soup, but we can estimate anywhere from 40 to 100 million, year, 100 million sharks a year are, are taken out of the ocean for this. And the short answer is it's just too many sharks. Um, sharks reproduce slowly. Um, they don't always have a lot of offspring, so it's very difficult. Uh, and, and the pressure is too high on sharks when we take that many out. So. Uh, surprisingly, sharks need your help um, today more than ever. And remember, sharks have lived through five mass extinction events. They've been here a lot longer than we have. And today, we're pushing some species literally to the brink of extinction. Um, so one of the things that you can do to help sharks is to get the word out, to talk to your friends and family and tell them about the story of the shark and that sharks are not monsters, but rather they are amazing creatures that deserve our respect and deserve protection so that they are able to survive um, and thrive in an ocean because truthfully, having sharks in an ecosystem makes it healthy. And we all want healthy oceans because that's what we depend on for our own health. So saving sharks is really almost saving ourselves. It's a very important thing. So again, support organizations that uh, try to help sharks. That's a really big thing that you can do. Um, and you can also learn more about sharks. It's, uh, they're fascinating creatures, as you know. And uh, I, I just want to share a couple of other things with you before uh, we end today. So this, I'm going to share a little model with you here. This is the outside of a great white shark, so you know what that looks like. But what you might not know is what the inside of a great white shark looks like. So this is um, the jaw of the great white shark right here. So you can see the jaw. And then they have a skull called a, a cranium, a chondrocranium. They have a vertebral column, a spinal column, just like you and I do. And they have gills. So remember, sharks use gills to extract oxygen from the water, just like our gill, our, our lungs. So sorry, uh, that's what they're doing, pulling that oxygen out. And then this big purple structure inside the body, this big one, is their liver. And so the liver secretes an oil that allows the sharks to be buoyant. It, it's a lightweight substance uh, because gravity works in water. And so if you have a 3,000 pound shark, they're fighting gravity as well. And so having that uh, liver uh, full of uh, oil helps them be a little bit more buoyant. All right, and I wanna share another thing with you that I think you'll find interesting. This is, whoops, this is the jaw of a sandbar shark. And so it kind of has the normal sharky looking teeth triangular and pointed uh, teeth. And what's interesting to know is that shark's teeth can change shape over uh, their lifetime. So for example, a baby great white shark will have very needle-like teeth to help it eat fish, which is its prey as it's young. But then as it gets older uh, and starts eating seals uh, and other fat uh, pinnipeds like that, like seals and sea lions, um, the teeth change to be more triangular and serrated. And so there's a change over time in the shape of the tooth, and that gives us clues as to what the sharks are eating. But what's also uh, good to know is that sharks' teeth are modified scales. And so you can see here um, that the shark's teeth, there's almost a conveyor belt uh, behind here. 
and the shark's teeth uh, are always constantly being pushed forward. And you can see that here. So over a shark's lifetime, it might have uh, 25,000 teeth that come out and uh, are pushed out of the jaw. And then I want you to see this. This is the uh, jaw of a tiger shark. So I hope you can see that here. The tiger shark have very unique teeth. Uh, the shape is like a, a knife and a saw in combination. And you can see that here. So the tiger shark's tooth is very unique. And if I turn it back to the inside, again, you can see that conveyor belt of teeth uh, always being pushed forward so that a shark always has a sharp set of teeth uh, to, to get its prey. And this is what the tiger shark looks like. They're beautiful. They've got stripes. That's how you know you've got a tiger shark. All right, and then one last thing I'd love to share with you is uh, this tooth. This is a huge tooth. It's a, it's a replica of Cicaridon megalodon. So the megalodon was a shark swimming in our ocean, not geologically speaking, not that long ago, um, just a few million years ago. And this shark used to eat whales. And, and, and it used to eat, it was huge. Uh, but conditions changed on Earth somewhat um, at that time and was not favorable to the megalodons. And so they went extinct. And it really gives us a lesson about how subtle changes um, can have big impacts and actually can cause the extinction of species like the megalodon. Um, so it's fascinating to think about those things. And I think it's important to understand that uh, we're in a time when, you know, conservation of species is truly important. And I think connecting to nature is also a really important part of the puzzle to feel a connection, to have empathy um, for sharks and to understand that they really are an important part of our ecosystem. So I'm going to end now and I uh, would just like to say I hope you learned something about sharks today that you might not have known and have a greater appreciation for the role they play in a healthy ocean. And if you have any questions or your students have questions, please email us. We'll get back to you um, any, as quickly as we can to answer all of your questions. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day.